Hi, today I'd like to tell you about running SQL Server and containers using Kubernetes on AWS. Okay, so in the previous video, I showed you that you can run SQL Server inside a container. But a single container is not enough for a production workload of SQL Server because the container may crash for various reasons. And you may need to have different containers. More than one container and managing all of those manually is something that's not really practical. And there are a lot of problems that you would have to solve. For that reason, there's something called orchestration engine. An orchestration engine basically solves all of the problems for running containers in any other kind of distributed system for you. One of those orchestration engines that's established in the community is Kubernetes. To have a basic understanding of Kubernetes, it's important to understand it's a centrally managed distributed systems orchestrator for running containers. Let's break down that sentence to better understand what it means. First, Kubernetes is a distributed system, which means it allows you to run your applications on a pool of hardware resources, available from several individual servers and hosts that are joined into a cluster. Here, you can see we have a cluster of three hosts, Node 1, Node 2, and Node 3. And all of those are connected to what is called a master node on top. Here's the centrally managed part. Kubernetes is centrally managed, which means there's a central authority known as master node, which is in charge of the cluster. The master node keeps track of which hosts or which of the worker nodes are joined to the cluster, how much resources are used or are available on each host, and on which hosts should a container be placed. What is the status of each container? Either it's pending, running, failed, or other statuses, and etc. Although Masternode is a central authority, but Kubernetes supports having Masternodes redundantly deployed to enable high availability and avoid single point of failure. On the other side, it's it's specialized to run and orchestrate containers meaning it solves common problems for running containers at scale and in production, such as resource management, monitoring, scheduling and container state management, logging, networking, secret management, etc. Once you have a Kubernetes cluster available, it's fairly straightforward to utilize it and deploy your workloads on it. But deploying and maintaining a Kubernetes cluster itself could be a new challenge. So, we want to solve that challenge. And here's the solution. Amazon EKS, or Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. EKS gives you three managed master modes in a cluster, and you can join your worker nodes to that cluster. So, all of the complexities of setting up master nodes are abstracted away. All you need to do is to join worker nodes to it and configure your client kubectl to connect with the endpoint of the managed EKS cluster that's provided by AWS. Now we're going to deploy SQL Server on top of this managed EKS cluster. Once we have the cluster, the next thing to do is to create the storage classes. In Kubernetes, Storage is decoupled from the rest of the cluster. The storage solution of Kubernetes is designed in a way to have a different life cycle than the containers on which those storage volumes are mounted. So there are three concepts to understand. First of all, most of you should already know what EBS volume is. It's a managed service that gives you a block storage solution. And you can mount it on your instances, your virtual machines, 
and you can utilize it in your EC2 instances. To utilize these EBS volumes in Kubernetes, you have to create something called a persistent volume. The persistent volume is an object type in Kubernetes that abstracts away all of the complexities of implementation of the underlying storage solution. So your containers and your applications would not care what kind of solution is providing the storage. For example, whether it's EBS volumes, IO1 or GP2 or, or other types of EBS volumes, or if it's an NFS share or some other type of storage, containers don't care about that. All of that is encapsulated in a persistent volume. Once you've created the persistent volume in Kubernetes, to mount it and connect it to your container, you have to create another object that's called a persistent volume claim. A persistent volume claim is a request for a persistent volume. There is also a concept of pod in Kubernetes, which could be one or more containers that always run on the same host. So your pod will have this persistent volume claim attached to it, which in turn contains a persistent volume and that facilitates connection to an underlying storage such as an EBS volume. The third concept is a storage class. So the persistent volume and persistent volume claim only include details such as the size of the storage that has to be provisioned and what mode should be used to connect with that storage. For example, whether it should be read-only or it should be read and write. But your application might have other requirements such as the IOPS available in that storage solution or the throughput available in that storage solution. For that reason, we have this concept of a storage class, which classifies different types of storage solutions. For example, EBS GP2 is the general purpose storage solution. In AWS, EBS GP2 is considered one storage class. EBS IO1, provisioned IOPS EBS volume, is another storage class. And there are other storage classes, such as an NFS share or Portworx volumes. All of those are described as storage classes and introduced to Kubernetes. So when you create a persistent volume claim, it can include a property of storage class. And if you specify, for example, GP2, then it will find a persistent volume that's associated with a GP2 EBS volume. You can also have a default storage class. So what is a default storage class? And when could it be useful? When you create a persistent volume and you request, for example, eight gigabytes of storage, the persistent volume claim will try to find a persistent volume that matches the requested size. Eight gigabytes of storage. But if it can't find it, it won't be able to provision that storage for you. However, if you already have defined a default storage class, then the persistent volume claim can use the default storage class to create a persistent volume and then provision the default storage class based on the requested size. There are different options for storage in Kubernetes. The main option can fall under two categories. First of all, you can use GP2 or IO1. Both are storage classes that are available for EBS volumes. And the other option is to use a cluster storage. The difference between these two is that the GP2 and IO1 are direct mappings to EBS volumes. And as most of you might already know, EBS volumes are available in a single availability zone in AWS. So if for any reason your container fails or the container host in that availability zone fails and your container needs to fail over to another availability zone, 
the storage will not be able to move with it from availability zone of origin to destination. But if you have a clustered storage solution, it will mirror the storage. The blocks that are written to the EBS volumes in availability zone one into the second availability zone or even third. So this mirroring is called clustering and you'll have a cluster of storage available. And if there is a failover, you already have the data replicated and available in the other availability zone. And you can quickly mount that to your container or pod and continue your read and write operations. This is essential for a SQL Server, especially if you want it to be highly available in more than one data center and more than one availability zone. But the downside for it is that you need to use at least twice the amount of storage because you're mirroring everything from first availability zone to the second. So if you're optimizing for price, you might prefer to use GP2 or IO1, which gives you single AZ high availability. But if you want high availability in more than one data center and more than one AZ, then you can use a clustered storage class such as Portworks. The other benefit of using a clustered storage is higher IOPS and throughput. With a single EBS volume, using GP2 and IO1 storage classes, you're limited by the amount of IOPS and throughput that's available for a single EBS volume which is not a small number. It suffices for most of the practical purposes. But in any case, if you need to go beyond 32,000 IOPS or beyond 500 megabytes per second throughput, then you can use a class for storage which will stripe several EBS volumes and give you the aggregate throughput. And that is limited only by the IOPS and throughput limit per each EC2 instance. Regarding high availability, again, to emphasize, this is the most important difference between GP2 and IO1 and clustered storage. If you have a container failure, both of the solutions will immediately recover your SQL Server instance. If you have a pod failure, again, both of them will immediately recover. If you have instance failure, you could have immediate recovery with GP2 and IO1, only if there's another instance available in the same availability zone. With cluster storage, you'll have immediate recovery. If you have another EC2 instance, either in the same availability zone or in the other availability zone in the same cluster. So that's more inclusive. It can also include instances in other availability zones. In case of host failure, that is the host of the EC2 instance, same story again. If you have another host on the same availability zone, Kubernetes will restore your container and your SQL Server application will recover. Otherwise, it will not, and it'll stay in pending state until it's available. In case of cluster storage, same story, but not bound by a single AZ. It could be in the other AZ as well. And finally, if you have a total availability zone failure, definitely if you're using GP2 or IO1, you will not be able to recover your SQL Server instance and containers until the AZ comes back online. But if you're using clustered storage, again, if you have another instance pending, standby in the other availability zone, you'll have an immediate recovery. Okay. That's all for SQL Server running on Kubernetes. That's the theory. In the next video, I'll show you how to deploy SQL Server on Kubernetes using AWS EKS service. Thanks for watching.